This video will cover norms, utilitarianism, and deontology. The term norm is related to the idea of normal. Norms are standards for success. These are often contrasted with descriptive terms. A descriptive term is one that attempts to describe. So for example, I can say the sky is blue, the window is open, today is Thursday, and all of these are descriptive claims which describe how things are. On the other hand, normative claims don't describe, they express a judgment. If I say this is a good movie, this song is great, this color is ugly, I'm not describing a fact, instead I'm expressing a judgment. These are all normative claims. The norms can change quite a bit depending on what sphere of activity you're talking about. In basketball, the norm or standard for success would be points, winning games, covering the spread, or other terms that are related to basketball. The norms for music would be different. Music can be beautiful, it can evoke emotions like passion, enthusiasm, sadness. Those would be ways of determining whether or not music has succeeded at what it intended to do. For school, the standard for success is good grades, high GPA, gaining knowledge, getting a job, Notice the norms for all of these different spheres are very different from one another. The norm for science is whether or not the results are empirically verifiable, whether they're falsifiable, whether an experiment can be repeated. Again, a norm is a standard for success, and it will be different depending on what type of activity. For philosophy, the norms are rationality, consistency, whether or not philosophy is illuminating. And that brings us to morality. This course is about the philosophy of ethics, so it's also going to have the norms from philosophy, those being rationality and consistency. But in general, morality has norms like good, right, righteous, decent, virtuous, sanely, and I'm sure you could think of other words. Next, I'm going to talk about two substantive ethical theories. Substantive ethical theories are specific theories which will tell a person what is right or wrong. This is different than meta-ethical theories because those tell you which of these theories to prefer. Now we're going to go through several substantive ethical theories. The first is utilitarianism. This is a consequentialist theory, which means that it determines what's morally right or wrong, depending on the outcomes. In other words, the ends justify the means. The idea behind utilitarianism is that every action that every person takes is basically in order to reach happiness. Why do we go to school? To make money so that we can spend it and be happy. Why do we have friends? Because they make us happy. Why do we avoid pain? Because avoiding pain makes us happy. The idea is that since morality is meant to be the best standard for how we should treat each other, then if, since everything we do is to reach happiness, then the highest standard would be to increase pleasure or decrease suffering for everyone. The basic principle of utilitarianism is do whatever leads to the greatest utility. Utility is either an increase in pleasure or decreased suffering. There are two major varieties of utilitarianism. The first one, act utilitarianism, considers morally good whatever action leads to the greatest utility. So if you're in a situation and you're trying to decide what the morally correct thing to do is, 
what you do is you look at the possible actions and you determine which one leads to the greatest utility, which one will lead to the greatest happiness or the least suffering. For example, if I'm trying to decide whether I should eat cake or salad, I would look at which would lead to the greatest happiness, not just for me, but for other people involved. For example, if I eat salad, I'll be less happy right now, but tomorrow I'll probably be more happy about it. Also, if I eat the salad, then someone else can eat the cake and their happiness is increased. The second variety of utilitarianism is rule utilitarianism. This one's very similar, but instead of looking at specific acts, it looks at rules that people can follow. In other words, to be good means to follow whichever rule leads to the greatest utility. In other words, which rule will lead to the greatest happiness or the least suffering? Here, instead of comparing specific acts, you consider different rules which would guide your actions. So I'm trying to decide whether I should follow the rule, do homework first or watch TV first. What I would do is I would look at which one of these will lead to the greatest happiness, not just today, but in the long run, and not just for myself, but also for other people. Sometimes this will give the same result as act utilitarianism, but sometimes it'll give a different result. The next substantive ethical theory is deontology, or Kantian deontology, because the version we're going to look at was invented by Immanuel Kant. The term deontology means according to the nature of logic. In other words, this ethical theory tries to determine what's right or wrong using just pure logic. The reason that they think this will work is because since morality is meant to be universal, there will be no exceptions. The way that moral duties are determined is using what are called categorical imperatives. Categorical imperatives are guidances or commands that are logically guaranteed, universal, and always applicable. Deontology doesn't allow for any exceptions. Using the categorical imperatives, you determine what your moral duties are. Then, in order to be a good person, you have to have good intentions. You have to intend to follow your moral duty. This is a major difference from utilitarianism because utilitarianism only looks at the consequences consequentialist. Instead, deontology says that the only good thing is good intentions. In other words, it is not about the consequences. Categorical imperatives are the logical principles that we use to figure out what our moral duties are. The first categorical imperative is to act only on that maxim by which you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. Here, the term maxim means a moral rule. In other words, what it's saying is that in order for something to be a moral rule, it has to be something that can logically have to apply to everyone, always, everywhere. The way that you can figure out whether something fits this imperative is to look at the opposite. If the opposite of a moral rule logically self-destructs, then that's logical proof that it is in fact a moral rule. For example, there is an ethical duty to not commit murder because if you look at the opposite, if there was an ethical duty to commit murder, then everyone would kill each other and then there'd be no one left. Once there's no one left, it would be impossible to commit murder. In other words, there is a moral duty to not commit murder because the opposite, to always commit murder, destroys itself. It would become impossible to commit murder. Similarly, according to this categorical imperative, there is a moral duty to not lie because if there was a moral duty to lie, the opposite, 
then everyone would lie all the time and no one would be believed. If you try to lie to someone, but there's no chance they believe you, then you can't really lie to them. In order to lie, it has to be possible or even likely that you're telling the truth. In other words, if everyone lied, then it would become impossible to lie. Lying would destroy the possibility of lying. In other words, there is a moral duty to not lie because the opposite self-destructs. The second categorical imperative or logical principle which will help us determine our moral duties says, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in any other person, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. In other words, don't totally objectify people. Don't treat them entirely as a means to an end. This will also indicate that you shouldn't murder people because when you murder someone, you're treating them like an object that just needs to be removed. Similarly, when you lie to someone, you objectify them. What you do is it make, make it impossible for them to make rational decisions about the situation because you're hiding some aspect of it from them. In other words, you don't let them make free choices. You treat them like an object. Deontology is very strict. So when it says don't murder and don't lie, it means never under no circumstance. This is a very big difference from utilitarianism because according to utilitarianism, sometimes it would be okay to lie if it led to the greatest happiness. For deontology, you're never allowed to lie ever. Seriously. Never lie. Someone once asked Kant, um, can you lie if you have a friend over at your house and then an, an ax murderer comes to the door, knocks on the door and says, hey, is your friend here? I want to ax murder them. Kant said you shouldn't lie, even in that circumstance. Because let's say you lie and you say your friend's not there. Your friend went to the Starbucks at the end of the road. The ax murderer leaves. But what if your friend overheard the axe murderer at the door, climbs out the back window and goes to hide at the Starbucks? Then the axe murderer finds them and murders them. One of the ideas behind deontology is that since you can never anticipate every possible result of your actions, the only thing you can do, the only thing that you can really control and be a good person about are your intentions. So you have to know that it's your duty to never lie, and then you don't lie because it's your duty. That doesn't mean you have to help the ax murderer. It just means you can't use a lie to objectify the ax murderer and try to control the outcomes. The only good things are good intentions, not good outcomes. Thank you for watching.